Wow. All praise goes to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. Thank you so much. Such a warm welcome. Well, my wife and I are so excited to be here at Dream City Church. What an amazing facility and church and campuses you have. You are all very blessed, very blessed to be here. And so all of you joining us online, thank you for watching. And all the other campuses, so appreciate. We thank you for having us and for listening. And we are so honored to be in Pastor Tommy Barnett's pulpit. Amazing man of God. So blessed. And pra Pastor Brad and Pastor Luke and Angel and uh, Pastor Gary and past, uh, all the other pastors, Pastor Dave, all amazing people of God. So you are very blessed to have all of them. And again, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much. You know, on November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Bible has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that's classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, just like Paul and John, they actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And in Ezekiel chapter eight, he was carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept, he conversed. So my point is, in your spirit body, the things experienced are just as real as they would be in your physical body. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. I've been a Christian for 53 years. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. And Job 7.14 says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can't have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. One thing that was unique about this vision was God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. You say, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their mind, and he hid it from my mind for a reason which I will get to and explain. Now, the last thing is you might say, Bill, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to hell. Why do I need to hear about hell? Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. A lot of Christians today believe in a teaching called annihilationism, and that's a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus, but that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life, and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting as the word ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. You'll thank God he saved you from that horrible place. Number two, it causes us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is simply that you obey him. You have enough respect for Almighty God that you will do what he's commanded us to do. And number three, it'll give us more of a passion for the lost, a desire to want to witness. You know, Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. And yet we're all called to do that. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, even though that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, most of the commentaries agree he was also talking about judgment and hell in general. So when you understand judgment and hell in general, you'll be more persuasive with men. I mean, you'll get up each day and you'll say, Lord, use me today. Put me in front of somebody today that I can witness to. You'll have a passion for the lost. See, you'll get on your knees maybe. Just not pray a little glib prayer, but you'll get on your knees and maybe fast and pray and cry out to God and say, Lord, I cannot let my family or my friends go to hell. They cannot. And you'll take more effort. You'll be more sincere. And that's what hell will instill in you. And that's our purpose. We went to a prayer meeting, we attended every Sunday night, nothing unusual about the night. I had never studied the topic of hell at that point. I have never gone to dark movies, I've never taken drugs, I've never drank, and I never had a vision before. 
And I got up at three o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking through our living room and suddenly something pulled me out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. And I saw my body fall to the floor. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered into this open cavern-like area as I passed through and I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough hewn stone walls, bars, a filthy, stinking, dirty prison, but like a dungeon. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16, they shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And the Tyndale, the New International Commentary and many others point out that Jonah himself was actually at the gates of hell and it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's why I first found myself face down on the floor. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was far beyond the ability to sustain life. And I wondered, how could it be alive in this? It was like a blast furnace. And my reaction was I wanted to get up and run, but I, I could hardly move. I thought, what's wrong with my body? It took so much effort to move. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. So if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, it's a thousand times worse. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God, it's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two demons in the cell. They were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws that were actually about a foot long, and these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that, but I'll keep moving. And they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them, and they had an extreme hatred for God. They were blaspheming and cursing God. Now, we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm, Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. Then they directed that hatred they had for God, they directed towards me. And I wonder why, what have I done to them? But the one demon picked me up, threw me into the wall like I weighed the weight of a water glass. Demons have tremendous strength, you have none. I hit the wall, I felt as if every bone in my body had been broken. Now maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it felt that way. Now I have to explain one thing. I only felt a small amount of the pain. I understood that it was being blocked by God. And he blocked it from me but he allowed me to feel a small amount of the pain so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical pain. It's literal pain you're gonna feel in hell. Thank God that he blocked most of it. The other demon picked me up, dug its claws into my chest, and tore the flesh open. This was actually happening. I couldn't believe I'm living through this. I should be dead. But I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man, he had, a, Jesus talked about the rich man, he had a mouth to speak, he had a tongue, he wanted to drop water to cool his tongue. So he had a body, but it withstands these torments in hell. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds, it was all dry. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, the mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell. So you don't derive the benefit of mercy. Now, about this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, to describe to people what it looks like. But he withdrew his attribute of light and it returned to its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you could not see the hand in front of your face. It is so dark. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, he has set me in dark places as they to be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel it. 
And that's not an exaggeration. And Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. You could feel it. It just seemed to penetrate through every cell in your body. Now, I was taken out of this prison cell, and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit, I understood it to be about a mile across, a huge hole in the ground with flames raging high up in this open cavern. And it was not metaphorical or allegorical flames like some teach. No, I felt the heat, I saw the flames, but more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11:6 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Uh, Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many more scriptures about the fires of hell. But this is where I could first see people in this pit. I could see through the light, through the uh, flames, I, the light in hell does not travel. You know, a pit a mile across would produce a lot of light here on the earth, but in hell, it consumes it. But I could see through the flames, and this is where I could first, see, there was probably thousands of people in this pit, burning and screaming. And it's the most horrible sight to see a person on fire. I mean, they just, you could not distinguish a man from a woman. They just look like skeletons with like, it looked like flesh hanging off their bones. And the screams were so loud and deafening from the thousands of people. I wanted to escape the screams, but you have to endure that for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 57, 21 says, there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. No peace of mind, no peace of any kind. And Isaiah 32, 18 says, my people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people, so you don't drive the benefit of quiet. Now, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell, or Sheol is the Hebrew word, Hades is the Greek word for the current hell. I'll just give you two verses. Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32, and 33. Very clear, it's down deep in the earth. I understood that. I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. You remember when Jesus said, Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28, of how much worse of a punishment. But my point is, there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than you can ever imagine. I thought about my wife, I had my memory, I thought about my wife up on the earth, and I just wanted to be able to say goodbye to her. But I knew I'll never have that opportunity. See, Job 7, 9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You understand, you're not getting out. And you don't realize how tormenting of a thought that is to have no finality with your family. You can't say goodbye. You know, at least you want to hug them and tell them, I love you. I love you so much. And I, I knew I'll never hug her again. I'll never be to, to talk to her again, walk with her. And all that was a thing of the past. And she will not know that I still exist. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody, Right? There's pleasure in being with people, even if you don't know them. But in hell, you're kept isolated and at a distance. So you never have any conversation again. You're completely by yourself for all eternity. You have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It's just a waste. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody that's famous here on the earth. No one would know who you are there. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, your name is covered in darkness. You're forgotten in hell, Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, Deuteronomy 32.26, Psalms 109.15, explain that you're forgotten. That's a horrible thing. You know nobody's given you a thought up on the earth. Uh, the stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors. You know, Mark 9.25, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits. Demons have a disgusting, decaying, foul odor to them but also the smell of burning flesh. You're smelling burning flesh along with the demons and also the smell of burning sulfur. 
And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxic fumes coming up from the volcano, it's called sulfur dioxide. If you breathe it, it will kill you. It's, it's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is mentioned 14 times in the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air in hell to breathe. And so you have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. And maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this. But this is how you breathe in hell. It's like... <coughs> that was as much air as you could get. Well, that's not enough. Any moment you feel like you're going to suffocate. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. You need to sleep in hell. You know, even I, I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt like I was there 23 weeks without sleeping. I was physically exhausted. And I understood I'll never get to rest. You never get to close your eyes or rest. See, Revelation 14, 10, and 11 says, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind, because Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving, can't rest. But see, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127.2 said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. You're not his beloved. It's a place of turmoil and confusion. Jeremiah 20.11, Isaiah 45.16 mention everlasting confusion. Job 10.22, a land without any order. You know how we like things in order in life, right? Because we serve a God of order. Well, hell is the antithesis. Chaos, confusion, nothing makes any sense. I was standing next to this big pit of fire and I noticed the cavern walls were around me. And all along the cavern walls were demons. They were twisted and deformed and grotesque. Some were only two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. Um, they all had an extreme hatred for me and for God. And uh, there were snakes crawling all over everything. And then I noticed I was standing on a solid bed of maggots. And I looked and the maggots were crawling all over everybody and everything, maggots everywhere. But see, Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original, it's the word maggot. And you know, I didn't know this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after they consume the flesh, maggots die. I never realized that. They die after they consume the flesh. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? You're hungry. You never get to eat. You have the feeling of hunger for all eternity. Thirst. Remember the rich man wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue that Jesus talked about in Luke 16? You know, if I was to give you a drop of water, one drop, that wouldn't suffice, would it? You wouldn't value one drop, but in hell you would. You would do anything for that drop of water. And just think that rich man that Jesus talked about 2,000 years ago, he's still longing for that one drop that he'll never get. The fear level that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything any of us have ever, ever experienced. And I wanna share with you an experience I had just to relate to you so you can understand the level of fear that you have to endure forever. When I was 17, I used to surf a lot. We were surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. Great day, big day, uh, about 100 guys out. And we were pretty far out from the beach. And the guy next to me suddenly got his leg torn off. Shark got him. Now there was blood all over the water. So all us guys got up on our knees to get our legs out of the water. And I was on a nine foot board at the time and the shark passed by my board and he was longer than my board, one of the sharks. And it was a tiger shark. If you know anything about tiger sharks, they're vicious and they eat anything. Well, he came back and he bit my board in half. Now swimming in the water, my friend was knocked off his board. And then the shark came back, grabbed my leg and yanked me down under the water. Now you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. Right, even though you haven't been through it, you can at least imagine that kind of level of fear. 
Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register in hell. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with terror for all eternity. I mean, this fear never goes away. I just wanna take a minute and give you some scripture about being tormented in hell because you might say, come on, Bill, aren't you exaggerating this? You know, that's your idea of hell. No, that's the Bible's idea of hell. So can you bear with me for a minute while I give you some scripture about being tormented? Okay, Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Who's doing the beating? Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116, 3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19, for what good is the day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness, and as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Job 33, 22, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7, their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14, their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. Psalms 32, 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. And uh, Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. Matthew 22, 13, Jesus said, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke 12, 4 and 5, Jesus said, don't fear him who's after he's killed the body, no more he can do. Rather, I tell you, fear him who is after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say to you, fear him. Matthew 25, 41. Uh, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 23, 33. Uh, you, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? In other words, you cannot escape it. One more verse, Psalm 74, 20 says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Full of the habitations of cruelty. Look up the word cruelty. It's uh, number 2555 in the Strongs, and it's a Hebrew word. It's the word Hamas. We've heard that word before, right? The terrorist group Hamas. The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. Now you say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, Jesus said why. In Matthew 25, 41, he said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place, but he used the word prepared. That's the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven or make ready. So he's preparing heaven for us, hell for the devil. But what he did in the preparation was, you see, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So all the good we enjoy in life, the fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did in the preparation, he withdrew his goodness or his attributes. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1.5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says he is the prince of peace. So if you move, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't separate the two. You can't have the good without God. Can you see that? So if your person in life says, you know what? I don't want anything to do with God. Fine, there's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scripture, it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But... God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. You know, praise God. 
So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. Your choice. You know, people look at the ocean, the mountains, the trees, and say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? No, that's not Mother Nature. That's Father God that provided all that. Amen? That's right. Psalms 33, 5 says, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We get to enjoy his goodness while we're here, but if we deny him, we won't get to enjoy his goodness. As I was looking at all this horror, demons shoving people back in, maggots, I began being uh, lifted up this tunnel. I was ascending up this tunnel, and it was absolute pitch black darkness. And then suddenly, this bright light appeared. Now, I knew immediately who it was. There's no doubt in your mind when Jesus shows up, no question about who he is, none. Now, I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light, like no light I had ever seen before. And I just said, Jesus. And he said two words. He said, I am. When he said I am, I went out. I don't know if I died or passed out. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, after a time, he touched me. And when I came to, I'll never forget this, at his feet, I thought to myself, even though I've been a Christian for 28 years at that point, I thought if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I was so thankful for what Jesus did for me. The king of the universe came and died a horrible death on the cross to keep me out of hell. I just want to thank him. I didn't ask him any questions. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus. I just kept saying that over and over. You know, I, I, that's all you want to do. Praise his name. Yes. But after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind, and he would answer my thoughts. I didn't want to ask him any questions, but he answered my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I thought, Lord, I'm just going to share with you three. Eight things he shared with me, but for time's sake, I'm just going to share with you three. Um, I said, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image, and they hate me. Remember John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. Demons hate God, but they cannot hurt him, but they can hurt his creation. That's why Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. See, oh, the destruction, the evil, the sickness, disease, all that comes from the demonic realm. But Jesus came to have us give us life more abundantly. We serve a good God. Amen? Amen. So those demons hate his creation and they want to destroy us. I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. And he said, it's not a... Thank you, Lord. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But I have to admit, I complained for seven years, the first seven years about this. I wanted to witness to everybody, but I didn't want to share this experience. I told my close friend, because I knew he would believe me, and he said, Bill, would you come to my Bible study and share it? And I said, no way, I don't want to. Well, he convinced me to come three months later. I went, reluctantly. Well, it spread from there. So my wife and I started getting invited all over the country. So for the next seven years, we traveled, we paid our own way, and we never took one penny from anybody. And then after that time, the publisher came to me and asked me to write the book. So it's not something I was looking to self-promote. But I was happy to write the book because I placed in there over 150 verses in my first book and 250 verses in the second book. All about what I saw is already in the Bible. I'm just a signpost to point people to the scriptures. That's what's important for you to believe, not me. It doesn't matter if you believe me. But... But I complained to the Lord. I said, Lord, I feel uncomfortable. I'm too conservative a person uh, to do this. And he said, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Man. I felt so convicted. I said, Lord, I repent. I'm sorry. You know, and now it doesn't matter 
if I feel uncomfortable because if one person can come to the light of the scriptures and avoid this horrible place, it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel, amen? That's right. But you know, God's given us all something to do and there's no big shots with God. So whatever he's given you to do, you have a talent I don't have. I just encourage you, do what you can for God. Use your abilities and talents because you can reach people that I can't. And we don't have a lot of time. I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Remember I told you he blocked it from my mind? You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? As a Christian, we know our destiny is heaven. He wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And to understand that you'll never get out. See, in life here, even if you're in pain, you understand you can die to get out of the pain. But in hell, you understand you'll never get out. You'll never, ever escape the pain and torment. Can you, can you even conceive of that? All eternity, I want that to sink in for a moment to you because once the people are in hell, they cannot get out and they know I'll never get out. A hundred million years will go by and they're still, it's still day one. That's why this is so important for us as Christians to share the gospel with people so they don't have to go there. Just think about the two thieves on the cross. The one repented and received Jesus. The other one, he has an eternity to think about his procrastination. And he's right next to the Savior. He could have been saved. Anyway, we went above the earth and came out of this uh, tunnel and we were in a whirlwind tunnel. There's scripture for this too, uh, but I'll keep moving. And the Lord had me turn back around to look at this tunnel we just came out of. And people were falling one after another, after another, back down into hell. And he allowed me to feel a piece of his heart the anguish he feels for a soul falling into hell. I could not stand to feel even a piece of the anguish he feels. His capacity is so far greater than ours. I said, Lord, stop, I don't wanna feel that. But see, Ephesians 3.19 says his love passes knowledge. He loves each person so far more than we are capable of loving our loved ones. And he wanted me to remember that and he, I knew he, was, he died so people wouldn't have to go there. But yet people are falling one after another. But that's why he's entrusted us as Christians with the gospel. So we'll open up our mouth and less people will go down that place. So that's the purpose. He, that's the part that stuck with me the most of this whole vision was feeling a piece of God's heart. The love he has for everybody is way beyond what you can imagine. You might say, but Bill, how can this loving God then send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you're gonna go by the standard of good, then you have to go by God's standard. And you know, James 2.10 says, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. Revelation 21.8 says, if we lie once, we're guilty. If we have one foolish thought, even, Proverbs 24.9 says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought, that would exclude us from heaven. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's gonna say, no, not according to my standard, you're not good. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? That's right. But you know, you might not be convinced yet. You might be like a secular radio talk show host I went on with, syndicated across America, and they said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. So I got invited on, and he said, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse over my airwaves. You got that? None of that Bible on my airwaves. I said, okay. He said, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a, I'm a good person. So I should be let into heaven also. And if your God doesn't let, let me into heaven, he's actually guilty of a hate crime. That's what he said. He said, so what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? What do you say? You're live on the air. And I can't give scripture. 
God gave me an analogy. Thank God, right on the spot. I said, okay, you think you're a good person, you should be letting to heaven. He said, that's right. I said, okay, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country and you knocked on their door and you said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, you wouldn't expect them to. You have no relationship with that. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as the son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You don't know him. I said, see, God offered to be your father throughout your whole life, but you're the one that pushed him away. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Now you have the privilege of living at his house. But to expect to live at someone's house you don't even know, that's arrogance. And then he says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. And he said, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, well... Let me give you another analogy, which God gave me. Thank God. I said, okay, narrow mind. You think we're narrow minded and you think all roads lead to heaven. I said, say uh, you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I'm gonna go north on 95. I'm gonna get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Why well, are you going to tell me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house? I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. Well, the same thing. God gives us clear directions to his house. Uh, I think God knows where he lives. Amen. That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us specific directions on how to get to his house. That's right. One last thing, he said, can't God let me into heaven? You know, I, I don't kill anybody. That's the other misconception. If you don't kill anybody, you're good enough for heaven. I said, no, two reasons he cannot. Number one, a just judge would not be considered good if he let the criminal go free, right? The crime has to be punished. Our sin has to be punished. But God, Jesus took that punishment for us. So you can either let him take it or you can take it. But the second reason he cannot overlook our sins is because, see, Nahum 1.5 and uh, Hebrews 12.29 said, God is a consuming fire. And it says in Nahum 1.5 that all of us would be consumed at God's presence in our fallen nature. So see, his nature is different than ours. If I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned me, I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? No, I wouldn't say it, would it? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. My hand and fire are not compatible. Well, neither is a holy God and sinful man compatible. If we show up in his presence the way we are in our fallen nature, we'd be consumed. So how can we ever show up in God's presence? Only one way. If someone came and lived the perfect life and never sinned once, and that's Jesus Christ. And he stands before the Father and says, I've never sinned. I'll exchange my righteousness with you for their sin. If they would trust in the work on the cross, what I'm doing, then I'll consider their trust as if they were righteous. So we don't trust in our own works. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So if we trust in the cross, he considers our trust as if we are righteous. He takes our sin, washes it away. Now we can stand before a holy God as if we never sinned because our sins are dealt with. Now he gives us that new nature that's compatible with his. Isn't that an amazing plan that God came up with? He made a way where there was no way. You know, people say, I don't like this one way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way. He made a way where there was none. This is the clear direction to heaven. John 3, 36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, what does repent mean? Repent means to have a humble heart and to admit, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I want to turn away from my sin and I want to follow Jesus. See, it's not enough to mentally assent to the fact that Jesus is God and say, yeah, I can believe that and go live your own life, do your own thing. That's not repentance. You have to turn away from sin and agree to follow Jesus. Now, on your own, you can't resist sin. But when you get born again, God gives you a new nature and he gives you the ability to say no to sin.
but right now you just have to be willing. And number two, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You have to believe in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You wanna live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. Now, if you say, Bill, I just don't believe that. Well, then I have a verse for you. Revelation 21, eight says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now there's the warning. He just told you, if you don't believe my word, if you don't believe Jesus is the only way, you'll end up in the lake of fire. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe Jesus is the only way. So a person's own words send them to hell. And because God loves man, he gives us that free will to choose. He doesn't force you in anything. You have to make up your mind. But that was the warning. He's told you if you don't repent and receive Jesus, you will end up in hell. Now, you can call him a liar if you want, but you will stand before him at judgment day. Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book. He's gonna look to see if our names are in his book. You know, when the Titanic set sail, there were all different religions, all different beliefs, all different walks of life, and three classes of people, the lower, the middle, and the upper class on that ship. But after the ship went down at the White Star Line office in Liverpool, England, there were two signs posted. And the relatives would wait each day as a man would come out to write one of their relatives' name down on one of the signs. One sign said, known to be saved. The other one said, known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, there were all different beliefs, all different walks of life, and three classes of people. But in the end, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. It's your choice. It's your choice. So my question for you today here, and all you people watching online and all the other campuses, I'm gonna ask you, this is the most important question. Do you know if your name is written in his book? You have to be certain of this one. You can't make a mistake on this one because like I said, one second after you die, it's too late. You won't get a second chance. And you don't know that you'll have tomorrow. You might think, oh, I'll leave, I'll think about this later. And you don't realize your heart grows harder when you leave. Also, Jesus said in John 6, you can't even come to God unless he is drawing you. So on your own, you can't even come. If you think you can do this tomorrow, you might not be drawn tomorrow by God. So this is an opportunity you have right now. It's not an invitation because you can turn down invitations. This is an opportunity and they don't come often. So my question is, do you know if your name is in his book? I'm gonna ask at the count of three to raise your hand here and online and at the other campuses. If you're not certain if your name's in his book, you might not know, or you maybe never really repented, or you've been backslidden and you know better and you wanna get your life right with God. Well, today's the day. You have that opportunity right now and you can have assurance that your name's in his book. So I'm gonna ask you at the count of three to slip up your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hands, I see hands. I see hands all over. I see your hands up in the balcony, I see your hands. Thank you for your honesty. You know, most of us have done this, so it's nothing to be embarrassed about. And you wanna make sure God sees that hand because you wanna make sure he writes your name in his book. So you don't wanna do this half-heartedly. This is a commitment to God. If everybody would stand to their feet, I'm gonna invite each person that raised their hand, I'm gonna challenge you to get out of your seat quickly. Get out of your seat quickly, come down to the front and give us the privilege of praying for you. Give us the opportunity to pray for you. And there's something about getting out of your seat, you won't forget this time coming to the altar. In the balcony, make your way down, just quickly. This is really important. All of you online, you can say this prayer in a minute that we're gonna pray, and at the other campuses, come forward. If you can, come forward, make this commitment. This is the most important decision you'll ever make. 
And one more thing, you don't have to clean up your life to come to God. You just come to him and he'll clean you up. That's right. Amen. Wow. Praise God. Wow, what a beautiful sight. Do you know it says all of heaven celebrates over just one person coming to the Lord? Isn't it amazing? Heaven's a big place. And it celebrates over just you, but that's because how important every person is to God. He would have died just for you. That's amazing to me. So God is so proud of you coming forward. And we're just gonna wait another minute because this is so important. And on the other campuses also, please make your way down. And online, if you're home, you can do this. And again, please don't put this off. We're gonna say a prayer. It will change your whole eternity. See, the devil hates your guts and he wants to take you to hell. So he lies to people and says, ah, this isn't true. Who's, who knows? I can do this later. He's lying to you right now because he knows your soul is eternal and precious to God. Don't let them have your soul. It's the most valuable thing you have. All right. All of us can pray all this. And you guys that came up forward, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands. Okay? It's just like an act of surrender. Like, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I give you my life. He gave his for us, so we give it back, our lives. And we're going to say a prayer. This is going to come from your own heart, but you're going to repeat after me. Same online and the other campuses. We're all going to pray. You guys say this prayer. And all of us can say this. Are you ready? Yes. All right. All right. Say, dear God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. And I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. That he was crucified, died and was buried, but he rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I repent. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the cross, and thank you for taking me to heaven. And I now confess I'm a born-again Christian going to heaven and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. This, this is just the first step. This is just the first step, okay? This is the beginning. But you need to get involved in a good church. If you don't have one, you're in one right now. It's really important where you go to church, what you're taught. And this is a really, really good church. So God's so proud of you. Thank you so much. Hadn't this been a great morning? Phil, thank you so much. Are you thankful? Let's show our appreciation for this sharing this testimony. Thank you, God. I'm so grateful. So neat to see God move. And this is the first step. Today we're going to help you. Just a minute. We want every one of you to sign a new convert's card. This card will be used to help you, introduce you to all the programs we have, the follow-up to get involved in a new convert's class. And second, we got a Bible for you too. Right up here. And you can do the, all of this right at the altar. We're going to have counselors that hear. If anybody wants to talk to anybody personally, That'll be fine. But here's what I want to say. Everyone in this building that heard this message, and by the way, this is truly a great altar call. Let's give God a clap offering. This is what we're about. This is why we have church. And second, aren't you thankful for a church that still warns people of hell? By the way, why shouldn't we? Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven to warn us of this terrible place. But you know, this whole message was a love message that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to show us a way from this terrible place. Even the fact that there is a hell means that God's a just God. 
because how could anybody they get spy at court by murdering, raping, and walk away without any con without any judgment whatsoever? But God says He's a God that whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. There needs to be a hell if God is a just God. Come on, say a good amen out there now. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go buy his book. He's got four books out there. I want you to buy it for yourself, but even more so. Buy one for an unsaved loved one or somebody you know that needs God and get that book to them. And second, I want you to go out if you really believe there is a hell. If you listen to this message, listen to the Word of God. And by the way, what makes his testimony different than any I've ever heard is that he lines it up with the Word of God. Can you say amen for that? To disagree with this message is to not believe the Bible. For the Bible warns us of it. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to call your relatives and say, today I heard a message that changed my life. Would you read the book I'm going to send you? Would you? I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want you to go to this place. And I want you to try to bring somebody every week that needs God to these services because every week we give an opportunity for people to turn from hell to heaven. How many of you will say, Pastor, by the help and grace of God, I believe that this message even changed my life. Put your hand up real high today. Raise them all of this building. One more time. Bill, thank you for coming. Such an honor to be here. Uh, such great pastors, great teaching. And by the way, the worship here is amazing. And we love Pastor Adam, a friend of mine, man of God. And... Uh, you're so blessed to have the teaching and the worship that you have here. You know, and God's entrusted us all with the gospel, right? So just encourage you, use the talent God's given you and go out and win a world. The, you know, the last thing Jesus said to me was tell them I'm coming very, very soon. Yes. And he repeated himself and said, I'll tell them I'm coming very, very soon. I believe we're in that delay right now, like you said with the Matthew 25 about the bridegroom. And, but that time, I believe, is really short. So we need to get be about the Father's business. Amen? And never get used to this. This is why we have church. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. So be sure and sign with these commitment cards so we can help you. We can follow up, okay? You got it all right over here. Okay. The two dynamic leaders are ready to help you all out. We're going to leave worshiping today. What a great day. Let's praise God one more time for what he's done today. God bless you all. Bless you. Thank you so much.